Good morning. Good morning. I'm thankful, I'm thankful to be here to, this morning、uh, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with you. My hope and prayer is that we may exalt Christ through the text we read and、um, through, through our actions、um, in our lives.、Um, now, let us turn to、uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10,、uh, verses 23. To chapter 11, verse 1. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, to chapter 11, verse 1. Let me read the text for you, and you can follow along with your eyes. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the believers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, This has been offered in sacrifice. Then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but,、um, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, Do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. This is the word of God. Now, today I'd like to、um, start a sermon by、um, giving you the question that I received, one of the questions that I received、uh, during my、uh, previous ministry years. And the question is whether a Christian can、uh, drink alcohol or not. Now, this is an understandable question if you consider the context in which I、uh, preached and I ministered.、Um, so, for、uh, quite a few years, I、uh, Pastor to、um, second generation Korean students, mostly university students who go to Mac,、uh, McMaster University. And it's understandable because in Korean Christian culture, children are taught by their parents that if you're a Christian, the expectation is that you don't drink or smoke. So some of these students came up to me and asked me whether it's okay to、uh, drink alcohol or not. They wanted an answer from the Bible. Some others, they went straight to the authority. They went to the Bible and they found their reasons, a bit biased, but reasons to drink. They told me that since Jesus drank wine, they should be able to as well. They said, the Bible doesn't say don't drink, it says don't get drunk, therefore they should be able to drink. And I remember using this passage that we just read this morning to teach them that perhaps the main issue here is not whether they can drink alcohol or not. The main issue here is the fact that they're drinking when their Korean friends are present who think Christians are not supposed to drink. Now, Paul. In this passage, is dealing with a similar issue. Actually, not just this passage,、uh, the whole of uh, chapters uh, 8 to 10. The issue was whether Christians can eat the food that has previously been offered to idols. Can a Christian eat the food offered to idols or not? In chapter 8, the Corinthian Christians said they can because they knew something. And because they knew something, knew this, they have freedom to eat. Now, what did they know? Or what did they claim to know? 
They knew that there is only one God and idols are non-existent. So why should it matter if they ate the food sacrificed to these non-existent idols? Now what was Paul's response to this? That's what we see in chapters 8 to 10, where today's passage is actually the conclusion of the whole talk. Now in these chapters, Paul's baseline argument is one and the same. Use your freedom to put the good of others before yours. So we see in chapter 8 that the number one reason that Paul gives for not eating the food offered at the idol's temple was love and consideration for their weak Christian brothers and sisters who may still associate food with idol worship. If they see a Christian eating at the temple, they might imitate that Christian and end up falling back into idol worship again. So Paul says, don't eat it, not because there's anything wrong with the food, but for the sake of those weak brothers and sisters in your church. Now as Paul concludes this talk in today's passage, he switches the gear a bit and addresses the freedom that the Corinthians claimed they had. He teaches them what freedom they actually possess as Christians, how they should exercise that freedom, and what purpose, for what purpose God has given that freedom to them. So in this sermon, I'd like to share with you these three points about Christian freedom. First point is this, what is Christian freedom? And we see that in verses 23 to 24, and again in verse 26. The second point is this, how should we exercise our Christian freedom? Verses 25 and verses 27 to 30. And the third point is this, what is the purpose of this Christian freedom God has given us? And that's in um, chapter 10, verse 31 to chapter 11, verse 1. And then I will conclude with some applications for us. So first point, what is Christian freedom? Now, in today's passage, Paul begins with these words in verses 23 to 24. He says, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. I like the, uh, the NIV version, uh, NIV translation of this uh, specific uh, verse. Because there... Instead of saying, uh, all things are lawful, NIV translates it as, I have the right to do anything, you say. Because that's essentially what the Corinthians were trying to say. It's essentially the freedom they claim to have. We have the right to do anything we like. And surprisingly, it is awfully close to what, would, what we modern people would hear on the street. Now, to this, Paul says, but not everything is helpful or build up. In other words, freedom as the Corinthians understood it is only half true. Because not everything is helpful. Not everything builds up. And as we know, half truth is always false truth. So in the next verse, Paul gives a guiding principle that completes the picture of Christian freedom. Verse 24, he says, Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Now this is the guiding principle of Christian freedom. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Now, isn't freedom all about doing what one desires? Wouldn't this principle of Christian freedom actually violate Christian freedom? Not in Paul's understanding. To understand Christian freedom as Paul understood it, let us take a step back here and consider where this freedom comes from. Please look with me, verse 26. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. 
In other words, Christian freedom is from their God who has the ownership of the whole earth and everything in it, including the food that had previously been offered to idols. Now, Paul fleshes this out a bit more um, in chapter 8, the beginning of this talk on idols offered to, um, sacrifice to idols. If you look at chapter 8, verse 6, the first part of uh, uh, verse 6, he says, Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. All things came from this one creator, Paul says. And he reminds us that this creator is the Father. In other words, all Christians have a Father in heaven who created and are in control of all things that we see. Christian brothers and sisters, what does this mean for you? It means that though you may not know what tomorrow will bring, you know that your Father knows, uh, your Father in heaven knows. Though you may not have your life together at this moment, your Father in heaven is very present in your life. And because you know the Father, you know you are not some byproducts of random evolutionary process, but are created for His glorious purpose, for whom we exist. And the fact that this Creator God is your Father should give you that freedom, that confidence to live the life that you have, to eat the food, uh, the, 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 the food that enjoy. That the food that you enjoy. And then the latter half of that same verse, Paul also tells us another basis of Christian freedom. He says, One Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Again, going back to the Creator, our Lord being the Creator. He says, All things came through Jesus. You look at John 1, 3. It says, Jesus was the very word of God who went out from God and created all things. And through this Jesus, Paul says, we exist. We live. Because this Jesus obtained for us the right to become the children of God. We have freedom as God's children because of what he had done for us. So Paul says, through whom we exist. Through what he had done, we live and exist. Now, what did Jesus do? He laid down his rights as the glorious Son of God to give us that freedom that we enjoy in Christ. He took on human flesh, though he was the creator. Born in a manger, though he was the king of the universe. Grew up in a poor family, though he was the owner of the universe. He suffered false accusations, hostility throughout his life, though he only spoke the truth. And at the end, as we know, he was betrayed, he was beat up, sped on, whipped, slapped on the cheek, made fun of, before being crucified on the cross like the scum of the world. And yet, he knew no sin. So we understand from God's word that Jesus laid down his rights and freedom as the Son of God for our sake. That's how our freedom came about to us. So when Paul is telling Christians to seek the good of others, it's not merely because it is a nice thing, nice thing to do for our neighbors, 
It is because this laying down of one's right for the sake of others is the very principle by which Jesus freed us from our sin and death. Now compare this freedom to what our culture calls freedom. In our culture, freedom means autonomy. Rights means individual sovereignty, which says, I am my own. I am my own authority. I steer my own life in whichever way I like to, and no one can tell me what I should do or whom I should be. So when the Corinthian Christians said they have freedom to do anything, their idea was only half-baked. Because that freedom is not Christian freedom. Christian freedom is not rooted in individual autonomy, but in the Father's lordship over all things. That's where we have confidence. That's where we have freedom. Because our Father in heaven is the owner of all things. Christian freedom is rooted in Christ's sacrificial love through which we became children of God. So Christian freedom says, I belong to God who created everything. And Jesus saved me from futile ways of life. He restored me to God so that I could seek the good of others just as he has done for me. In this regard, Paul says in Galatians 5.13, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So this freedom we have as Christians is not about maximizing our freedom to do whatever we desire, but it is about magnifying the glory of God It is about reflecting Christ's sacrificial love in our dealings, daily dealings with others. It is about exalting Christ in His love and what He had done on the cross for us. And this brings us to the second point. How should we use this freedom we are given? In verses 25 and again 27 to 30, Paul gives examples of how Christians should use their freedom with Christ's love as their principle. Now the situation Paul is dealing with here in chapter 10 is a bit different than the situation he is dealing with in chapter 8, in the beginning of this talk. In chapter 8, Paul rebukes wholesale those who are participating in the meal offered at the idol's temple. Not only because it ruins the faith of other weak Christians, but also because, as we see in chapter 10, before the passage we read this this morning, that food given out at the temple may mean fellowship with demons, just as the Lord's communion means fellowship with the Lord Jesus. So in chapter 8, Paul clearly Condemns the, uh, con- condemns the act of having the ritual meal at the idol's temple. But here in today's passage, Paul gives another scenario where idol worship is no longer an issue. In this scenario, Christians are in the meat market. Christians are in, in the uh, in, um, unbeliever's house where the food may have been previously sacrificed to idols but is not linked to idol worship. And Paul here is focusing on Christian freedom and its guiding principle of restraining freedom for the sake of others. How should a Christian balance their freedom and restraint of their freedom? That's what he is dealing with. Verse 25, he says, Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. Again, in verses, verse 27, he says, If one of the believers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. 
Christian freedom says food itself is God's gift. And Paul is teaching here that Christians have the freedom to, have this, to receive this gift regardless of where it came from. But then Paul says there are times when they have to restrain their Christian freedom. In verses 28 to 29, he says, But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it. For the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience, I do not mean your conscience, but his. What is Paul saying here? He's saying that your conscience may be clear, but if eating the idle food is not beneficial for your neighbor's conscience, then you should restrain, refrain from it. Now, we don't know who is telling this Christian guest the source of that food. Someone is informing him that there's something wrong with this food. This food had been previously um, pre sacrificed to an idol. May have been another Christian in that, um, in that place. Or perhaps it was another believer, unbeliever. But in either case, this informant doesn't think a Christian should eat the food offered to idols. Also, based on what this informant says, the host may also come to think that Christians are not supposed to eat the food that had been offered to idols. So in this case, although the Christian is free to eat the food, Paul says, do not eat it for the sake of other people's conscience. Now, going back to the issue of drinking alcohol in the beginning of the sermon, if the Korean Christian student decided to drink and didn't mind other Korean students who are you know, thinking that Christians, Christians are not supposed to drink, he is clearly misusing his Christian freedom for himself. And he'll be putting others in danger of misjudging his Christian faith or the Christian faith entirely as something that is untrue, unworthy of one's whole commitment. So in verse 29, Paul says, For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? When I can use that freedom not to eat the food for their sake, and save them from mis misjudgments of this freedom. And when Christians use their freedom for the sake of others, you know what happens? It begins to fulfill, the, fulfill God's purpose for that freedom. And that is our last point. What is the purpose of Christian freedom? The purpose of Christian freedom, as we see in uh, chapter 10, verse 31 to chapter 11, verse 1, is this. To glorify God by seeking the good of others so, so that they may come to know Christ. Let me just repeat this for you again because this is important for us to understand is to understand uh, this last point. The purpose of Christian freedom is to glorify God by seeking the good of others so that they may come to know Christ. In verse 31, Paul says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, if we just look at this, I mean, this is a famous verse, and if we just look at this one verse, single verse alone, it's a bit abstract. What does that mean for us to do all to the glory of God? Doing things for the glory of God, what does that mean? But if we consider the context of today's passage, God is clearly glorified when we put the good of others before our own. And what is the ultimate good of every human being. It is that 
the person comes to know Christ and be saved. Because what if one gains the whole world and loses his soul? What is the use of all of his life? So the ultimate good of every human being is their salvation. And it is, it is that end to which Paul is instructing the Corinthians to do, to do the good of others. And this is why Paul says in verse uh, 33b, these words, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. His aim here is very clear, that they may be saved. That they may have the ultimate good, faith in Christ. And we see in chapter 9, Paul in this spirit renounced his right to be paid for his ministry, to buy as many opportunities as he possibly could afford in order that he may communicate the gospel to the Corinthians. He was seeking ways to save them by putting their need of God first before his own financial security. He is only imitating what Christ had done for him to put his salvation before his divine glory for his sake. So Paul says in chapter 11, verse 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Christian brothers and sisters, are we imitating Christ as Paul does? Are we in our mundane daily, life, daily routines making choices that are benefiting others, whether it's small or big? to exalt Christ and ultimately lead them to Christ. Paul in this passage talks about restraining our freedom for the sake of others. But you see, we as Christians are also called to actively seek out ways uh, to use our freedom as God's children to pray and, and, and find ways to serve our neighbors to the end that they may, know come, they may come to know Christ. For example, you may be shoveling snow on your neighbor's driveway. You may be making that chicken noodle soup for your sick neighbor. Perhaps you are opening your doors to your neighbors, inviting them over to have meals together. Perhaps you are patiently listening to their angry opposition to Christian faith. This will not only reflect the way Jesus used his freedom for our sake, but, but it will also buy us opportunities to speak into their lives about this Christ. But using Christian freedom to serve others and lead them to Christ also calls for wisdom and discernment. Because people from diverse cultural, uh, religious, socioeconomic, and family backgrounds would have different modes and ways of understanding. And Christians are called to use their freedom thoughtfully and humbly and learn their ways of understanding in order that uh, we can present the gospel in ways that they can understand. Serve them in a ways that they can understand Christ and His gospel. And this is why Paul says in chapter 9, uh, verse 20 to 23, says, To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might, uh, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. Now I do it all for the sake of the gospel. So let me just give you an illustration of this from my past experience before we conclude this sermon. Now if you go to South Korea today, there are a lot of traditional families that still perform ceremonies called chesak. 
where they pay respect and pray to their deceased parents, grandparents, and ancestors by bowing down to their names or pictures. And on the day of ceremony, all family members and relatives would gather and prepare this big feast meal, which they first dedicate to their ancestors, believing that their spirits, wandering in the air, would come and eat the food. And afterwards, they share the meal together. Now, when one of the family members becomes a Christian, the person typically doesn't show up to the ceremony for an obvious reason. Because it's directly against the first commandment. And the Christian has a freedom not to go. Now, there's this one young uh, married couple, Christian couple, I used to know in South Korea, where the husband's family held Jeza every so often. And they were in a very unique situation because they knew that if, if they didn't show up to Jeza, the ceremony, the husband's family members would not think that it was because of their religious perspective or religious reason. Rather, they would think that they were conveniently avoiding all the hard work and responsibilities of food, food prepping and, um, and preparing for the uh, ceremony in the name of faith. So they, the family would probably think that they're just misusing, they're abusing their faith as an excuse not to show up and not to get involved in all the hard work. Because the food and ceremony prepping work is strenuous and sometimes takes days to get ready. So this family would end up despising Christian faith because they were likely to misunderstand the Christian freedom this Christian couple were trying to exercise. So this is what this Christian couple creatively did in order to do the good of the family in hope that they may understand where they are coming from. So what they did was they showed up to the ceremony and worked harder than anyone else in preparing the food, preparing the ceremony, but wouldn't participate in the ritual. And they were persecuted by the family, as you can imagine, for some time, and treated like unwelcome guests. But they consistently went and showed Christ's love to the rest of the family. And eventually, other family members began to recognize that it wasn't because of this laziness that they're, uh, they're staying away from the ritual. It's because of this faith that they are committed to. And they began to ask questions about this faith, about the gospel. And at the end, the whole family turned to Christ and abandoned their Jesa ceremony. It was all because of this one Christian couple who used Christian freedom they had in their unique situation to do the good of others in ways that this family could understand the gospel. Again, people have different modes of understanding and we are called to exalt Christ by seeking to benefit others in ways that they can understand. Because that's what Jesus did. He took on human flesh, became one of us. Now, we conclude this sermon with some applications. If you are a skeptic or not yet a Christian today because you're afraid of losing your autonomy to faith in Jesus, I pray that you could reconsider. See that this freedom you have may bring you autonomy but could never offer you the true meaning and purpose of life. Because you did not choose to be born in the first place. None of us premeditated what meaning and purpose we would have for our lives before our births happened. Christian freedom, on the other hand, is, is in the fact that the Creator God is our Father in heaven. And He cared enough for us to send His, to send His Son to die for our sins so that we may have all our sins forgiven, and become His children. Now, if there is such a God, 
such a creator who does have this kind of love and care for you. True, true freedom is not to stay away from this creator God, but it is to know this God and call him your father. Now, for Christian brothers and sisters, this passage calls us to repent and grieve of our self-centered ways and selfish choices we have made in our daily routines, thinking that we could use our freedom in any way we desire, and ignoring the good of others around us, and not seeking their ultimate good of knowing Christ. Meditate on your Christian freedom and Christ's sacrificial love, the gospel essentially. This is where you will find strength and wisdom to exercise your Christian freedom to imitate Christ, to have the joy of the Lord being your strength. So meditate on your freedom you have in Christ. You are free because you have a heavenly Father who knows what you are going through, who has all things worked together for your good. You are free because you have a heavenly brother, Jesus Christ, who renounced his rights and sought your good and brought you into an everlasting life. Not through anything you have done or anything you have achieved in your life, but only through his cross alone. Pray for the wisdom and power of God that would enable us to deny ourselves daily and seek the good of others and not our own. Because it is so hard to deny ourselves, isn't it? As you just said, our spirit is willing and yet our flesh is weak. So we need to meditate on the truth. That gives us that strength. We need to pray for specifically, specifically for the wisdom and power of God so that we may go out and do the good of others to the end that they may come to know Christ and the gospel through you. May we begin to serve our children, our spouse, which oftentimes is the most difficult part because they're closest to you. All the family members, housemates, neighbors, friends, and the church by making those small choices each day, intentionally making these choices that will reflect and exalt Christ's sacrificial love. Though it's nothing compared to what he had to, what he had to renounce for our sake, so that they may come to understand Christ's incredible love for them. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for giving us Jesus Christ, who willingly renounced all his rights and freedom as your son, so that we may live. We, gra- we grieve, Heavenly Father. We repent of our selfish and self-centered ways in which we made our daily choices. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you may give us wisdom and strength. Proclaim to us your gospel each day as we think of Christ's sacrificial love. Help us to remember our freedom as your children, Heavenly Father, unconditionally accepted because only because of our faith in your Son. And help us, Heavenly Father, to make those choices daily, intentionally, for the sake of others, so that they too may rejoice in the salvation that's given to them through Jesus Christ.
We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.